Alright, so this is my first video in a couple months. I had to take my videos down for a while. There was a problem that necessitated me doing that, but the problem has been solved. And so now I'm back, and I want to comment on this whole Groiper War thing, this thing where fans of Nick Fuentes are going to the events of conservative people, Republican people like Matt Walsh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, Charlie Kirk, the founder of Turning Point USA, and they're asking them questions about issues like morality, like Israel, like race, designed to show that they're not really conservative on these issues. And this all really came into a head when Ben Shapiro dedicated an entire speech at Stanford to attacking and responding to these so-called groipers. And I think that they've done a pretty good job at exposing conservatives sort of for what they really are, or so-called conservatives anyway. You know, you take someone like Matt Walsh, and if you look at his Twitter, he has a lot of stuff complaining about anti-white bias in society. But a groiper comes up and asks about this exact thing, and Matt Walsh says that society doesn't have an anti-white bias. And why would he do that? Well, because Matt Walsh is part of this group of people that want to recognize that anti-white bias exists and then do nothing about it. Their solution to this is to tell people, and by people I mean their audience, which is almost exclusively white people, to get rid of their group identities. As if white people getting rid of their group identity is going to solve the problem of anti-white racism. And so, when Walsh is asked by someone who actually wants to do something about it, of course, he just denies that it even exists. Crenshaw went a step further when asked about anti-white racism, he actually just participated in it. He was asked about affirmative action, policies which take economic resources from white people and redistribute them to non-white people. And he said that that wasn't anti-white, but that we should oppose it because it hurts black people, as if, as if we should only oppose things if they hurt black people, as if something hurting white people is not a legitimate reason to oppose it, and therefore he was participating in any kind of anti-white racism in his response. Now, another thing kind of connected to race was that whole Covington case, uh, those Catholic kids who were accused of mocking some kind of Native American at a protest, we all know now that that was a lie. Now, Ben Shapiro, if you listen to him, he talks sometimes about how he's a big supporter of the Covington kids, and he has said this at his recent speech. Now, a fellow named Vincent James went to one of these events, he went to Matt Walsh's event and accused Shapiro of initially sending out tweets that were against these kids, and Shapiro said that this was absurd, that he's a big fan of the kids, basically, but the fact is that he's lying, right? Because we have the tweets. We have screenshots of Shapiro retweeting people attacking the kids as the story broke. This is taken from Vincent James's website. This is just fact. Now, speaking of things from Twitter, there's this controversy over Nick Fuentes supposedly attacking Matt Walsh because he condemned a mass shooter at El Paso. Now, if I understand Fuentes's position correctly, and maybe I don't, but if I do understand it correctly, he says that he did not attack Walsh because he attacked someone who had engaged in a mass shooting. It's because Matt Walsh said, quote, he's not the first white racist scumbag to mow down innocent people. And the idea here, right, is that this implies some kind of anti-white racial animus in the same way that it would imply anti-black racial animus if a shooting happened and someone said, he's not the first black criminal scumbag to mow down innocent people. And when talking about this in public, Shapiro and Walsh, they don't even present this possibility. They don't present the fact that Fuentes claims that this is what motivated him attacking Walsh. And in so doing, it seems to me they are misleading their audience. Now, on all of this stuff involving race and racism, Shapiro takes racism really seriously. He told Dave Rubin that, quote, there are legitimate racists and we should target them and we should find them and we should hurt their careers because racism is unacceptable. And consistent with this, he tried to get Steve King to lose his job as a congressman when Steve King said things that Shapiro took to be offensively pro-white. And now he's doing the same thing with Nick Fuentes. His position on this is a little unclear, though, because Shapiro, of course, said that Sarah Zhang, on the one hand, was an anti-white racist. He said, were her comments racist? Of course. And this is the New York Times editor, for those who don't remember, who tweeted very racist things about white people. He said, were her comments racist? Of course. Treating white people as a discrete group for the purpose of slandering them as textbook racism. But then he went on to say that she should not be fired because, quote, we're living in an age of social media mobbing and it's got to stop if we're ever going to have a semblance of social fabric left. So, Shapiro, on the one hand, says racism is very bad, damage the career of racists like Steve King and Nick Fuentes, but not anti-white racist Sarah Zhang. And the reason why we can't talk to Sarah Zhang is because this involves digging up old tweets and attacking people over them. Shapiro doesn't like this. Like, for instance, he doesn't like it when people attack him for tweeting, quote, Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap, and live in open sewage. This isn't a difficult issue. Hashtag settlements rock. That's from Ben Shapiro. And so he doesn't like this thing that people do now where you find stuff on Twitter and say, oh my gosh, look at this guy. What a racist. And yet if you look at Shapiro's speech, that's 
almost all he did with respect to Nick Fuentes, right? He didn't look at some debate that Fuentes had participated in, some episode of his podcast, and pulled out a full argument. He responded to Facebook posts and tweets, sometimes from years ago, that he used to say that Fuentes was a racist. And you could say a similar thing about Shapiro in incivility, right? Because Shapiro has attacked modern society for being too incivil in political debates. we got to be civil when talking to people who disagree with us politically. And yet in his speech, he's making jokes about Fuentes and the Groypers in terms of them, I guess, making fun of them for masturbating, for living with their parents, for all kinds of just very childish reasons. Now, moving away from race, although we're going to come back to it, the Groypers had an incredible exchange with Dan Crenshaw. Uh, Dan Crenshaw, the Republican congressman, I think from Texas, who was asked about certain laws in states like Florida and Texas, which say that Americans who work for the government cannot boycott Israel, basically. And the question was, doesn't this violate the First Amendment? And Crenshaw just called the person an anti-Semite, even though the person said that they did not support boycotting Israel necessarily, and even though anti-Semitism is supported by the First Amendment, right? This was a very shameful comment by Crenshaw, in which he seemed to imply that certain kinds of speech, where speech is actually just an expression of a political opinion, Right. That it is somehow not supported by the First Amendment or that it's illegitimate to ask about laws that prohibit it. Now, another really weird theme of Shapiro's speech was that the Groypers, they're trying to mislead people about Trumpism because they present themselves as fans of Trump, but Shapiro is here to tell us what the real fans of Trump think, and it is totally wrong to associate Trump with these far-right, uh, alt-right, although they don't call themselves alt-right, but Shapiro says they're alt-right people, and it's just not okay to associate Trump with the alt-right but Shapiro has been doing that for years, and so it's a really weird thing for him to say, right? Like, in 2016, after Trump won the Republican primary, Shapiro tweeted out a list of 20 people that he thinks either are associated with the alt-right or were friendly with it, and this included people that you would expect, Richard Spencer, Jared Taylor, and Donald Trump. And this is a weird thing about almost everyone that they've been attacking. The same thing with Matt Walsh. He said, quote, the only thing worse than Donald Trump are his supporters, and when Trump won the Iowa primary, Charlie Kirk said, the fact that Iowa could choose someone who openly brags about his affairs and has multiple divorces is astounding to me. This is a really weird comment from Charlie Kirk, because here he's suggesting that he gives a shit about socially conservative values, and as we're going to see shortly, there's just no way that that's true. Now, speaking of socially conservative values, one of the things that Shapiro and Walsh attacked Trump for during the election was when Trump said that women who get abortions should be punished in some way. Now, it seems to me just obvious that if you actually think that abortion is like murder, if you think it's killing an innocent person, then just as women would be punished if they hired someone to kill their newborn child, you would think that they should be punished in some way for killing their unborn child as well. This just seems obviously morally correct, and I can't even imagine what the argument against this could be. And so it seems to me that Shapiro and Walsh, whatever their position is on abortion, is not that they think that it is somehow analogous morally to killing an innocent person, or paying someone to kill an innocent person, because we do punish people for doing that. And so this was kind of an episode of Walsh and Shapiro getting mad at Trump because Trump came into the conservative movement and initially took socially conservative views a bit too seriously, right? He didn't understand the game that's being played here. And so in any case, it's weird, right? All these people who oppose Trump and now they're trying to define what Trump conservatism is. And in fact, uh, Charlie Kirk is about to release a book called The MAGA Doctrine. The only ideas that will win the future. And if Turning Point is any indication, you know, this MAGA doctrine is not going to please people who hold socially conservative values. So if you look at the chapter handbook for Turning Point USA, it notes that Turning Points is different from other court conservative organizations because, quote, we focus strictly on economic issues, no talk about abortion, gay marriage, etc. Now, this question of gay marriage is somewhat interesting. Shapiro's take on this is that the government just should have nothing to do with marriage. And so, it seems to me that neither Shapiro nor Kirk takes the traditional conservative position or, to my knowledge, has even addressed the traditional conservative position, which is, of course, that heterosexual marriage is good for society in multiple ways and so should be encouraged by the state via legal recognition and tax incentives. The other social issue worth talking about here is transgenderism. Charlie Kirk seems to advocate for the inclusion of transgender people in the conservative movement, as evidenced by his selfies that he's taken with Lady Maga. Shapiro's position on transgenderism is a bit stranger. It's not acceptance exactly, because he says that normalizing transgender norms through things like using preferred pronouns will damage the mental health of people in society and ultimately lead to more people killing themselves, and that seems really bad. But on the other hand, in an interview with Blair White, he said that he's fine of using people's new names that reflect the gender that they want, and in fact will even use their preferred pronouns when it's convenient to do so. And so on the one hand, he thinks that 
it's bad for society and it's going to cause suicide rates to go up, but on the other hand, he's fine with doing it. And that seems a little weird at least. And you know, whatever your position on these social and moral sort of issues are, I think we can all agree that they're not taking, none of these people are taking views that are really associated with being right-wing in any way, because none of them take a view as conservative as the average American 10 years ago, right? Uh, at least not on gay marriage and transgenderism, where most people 10 years ago, they didn't even think about transgenderism and they weren't going around using people's preferred pronouns, and people did not support gay marriage. They didn't support the government not having anything to do with marriage. They supported the government explicitly favoring heterosexual marriage. And so you look at this and you kind of get the feeling that these people are not supporting the values that people might imagine they should be supporting as the leaders of sort of young right-wing thought. Now Shapiro has a saying. He says, facts do not care about your feelings. And that sounds like a pretty good saying, right? The idea here is that we should just take facts for what they are. We should not care necessarily about how we feel about them, or at least not care so much that it's going to distort our view of what the facts are going to be, and have the moral certainty that whatever the facts are, we're not going to start hating people irrationally for things they didn't do, right? So we can face uncomfortable facts about something like group differences without inducing a moral panic. And yet, Shapiro so clearly does not believe this. You know, when he denounced Steve King as racist, it was because King was saying that race was connected to people's ability to assimilate into Western values, and that is just a factual question. And so, we know that Shapiro thinks that there are factual views, and he thinks that how someone thinks about these facts should dictate our feelings towards them. Specifically, if you take the wrong view about the probability of assimilation and how that varies by race, then quote, we should target you we should find you, and we should hurt your career, right, according to Shapiro. And at least this is true among people who take views that Shapiro thinks are racist, but not racist in a way that is against white people. If it's anti-white racism, then of course we should leave your career alone, because to do otherwise would be fundamentally uncivil. And so it starts to feel again like these people are kind of full of shit. It also starts to feel like they're very intolerant, and even totalitarian in a sense, right? Because how you think the world is, just what seems true to you, that is not something you decide. And we're going around morally judging people and ostracizing them and economically punishing them for something outside of their control and that takes place in their mind. And that seems, to me anyway, kind of disturbing. And it's especially disturbing to think that we got to punish people for holding racist beliefs when Shapiro's arguments against racism, so-called, are just so bad. You would hope that at the very least, if he's saying that you cannot be a moral person and believe this, it would be because he thinks that there are really good arguments against this. But what does Shapiro have in the way of arguments? He says that every immigrant who has ever come to the United States has been hit with the hammer of they're not willing to assimilate enough, but after 20 years they assimilate. He said this when talking about Steve King. He went on, quote, this happened to the Germans, the Irish, the Italians, the Asians, it happened to legitimately everyone who's come to the United States, and this is just completely insane. So. The fact is, and a lot of people don't understand this about mass immigration in American history, what went on is that people came to this country and if they didn't do well, they left. Between 1850 and 1913, this was true of about one in three American immigrants. For some nationalities, this was true for the majority. Between 1890 and 1920, 54% of Italian immigrants returned to Italy. And again, the poorer immigrants were, the less well they did in America, the more likely they were to return. Now, if you look at the empirical research on this, people basically assimilated as much as they were going to economically within the first five years of being in the US. But this isn't assimilation that's showing somehow that a representative sample of people from any country can assimilate to the United States. All this shows is that if you bring a bunch of people in and you kick the people out who don't assimilate, then the ones you're left with have assimilated. And that shouldn't be impressive to anyone and shouldn't in any way support some late 20th century egalitarian view of race. That's just ridiculous, frankly. Now, culturally, you know, I talked about the economics, but in terms of culture, what's gone on is assimilation, but both ways. And this is talking about European immigrants, and they've changed to be more like us, where us being sort of the pre-existing United States, but the United States changed to be more like them, right? We went from a Protestant nation to a Christian nation. We went from a Northwestern European uh, nation, or at least that was the racial group that was dominant in the country, to a white one. Even our food changed, right? Like, we have Italian food all over the place now. Politically speaking, you know, white Catholics assimilated somewhat, but again, not all of the way. So they used to be reliable Democrats. Now they're not, but they're not reliable Republicans in the way that white Protestants are either. They kind of go back and forth. And this is assimilation of people who are the best targets for assimilation imaginable. These are people, especially white Catholics, right? People from Western societies who are racially white and who have been here for a long time. And even they have not fully assimilated to the United States 
at least to what it was prior to them getting here. Now, it's been 70 years since Jim Crow ended. African Americans haven't even come close to assimilating at all on any of these things. You look at Hispanics, three generations in, they're lagging behind in terms of income, in terms of educational attainment, and in terms of IQ. So where's this 20 year bullshit rule of Shapiro's, oh, after 20 years someone assimilates? There's no group that took 20 years to assimilate. The people who were going to assimilate did almost right away, and everyone else has been here for decades, for generations, and made almost no progress. Now let's zero in on this voting thing, because conservatives, and Ben Shapiro in particular, just have atrocious views about the relationship between race and voting. So. Firstly, there's this idea among conservatives that what you gotta do is convince minorities to become conservative and then they'll vote Republican, and this will not work. We know it won't work because usually self-identified conservative Hispanics in the United States vote for Democrats. It is not just an ideology thing. Even if we look at specific policies, Hispanics who take right-wing views on issues like welfare spending, abortion, and immigration still identify Ned as Democrats. Shapiro, in his speech, said something incredibly stupid about race and voting. He said the fact is that a huge percentage of California Hispanics vote for Democrats, but 80% of Florida Hispanics currently favor Governor Ron DeSantis. Hispanics don't universally vote one way because race is not the basis for voting. And it's like, could you be more wrong? Could you have picked a worse example? Is, is a worse example imaginable? I don't know. Here are the facts. The reason that Florida has Hispanics who vote Republican is because it's full of Cubans. Cubans tend to identify as Republican, but non-Cuban Latinos in Florida vote for Democrats. Now, how does this connect to race? Well, you look at California, and it is a bunch of Hispanics who are from places like Mexico, where people are majority non-white, genetically speaking. These are mixed people, but people who are mostly non-white, and they mostly vote Democrat. What about Cubans? Cubans, on average, over 70% white. They are more white than non-white. Shapiro's great argument against the idea that race matters in voting is that the one Hispanic group in this country that sometimes votes Republican is also the most white Hispanic group in the country. So there's no way to properly describe this argument other than stupid. And in fact, it's worth noting there's a more robust relationship here. The more white a Hispanic is, the more likely they are to be a Republican in general. Shapiro also made lots of other ridiculous comments about race. He said that culture may be the most basis for voting, but ethnicity is not because race is uncontrollable. Culture is a different thing. That affects how you think, as if race doesn't affect how people think. He says white civilization is a nonsensical term because civilization is not defined by color, but by history and culture and philosophy, as if races don't to some degree share a common history, culture, and philosophy. He says, what do white ideals look like? Do white ideals look like professors at the university who are overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly socialist? How about European ideals, like the socialists over in various parts of Europe? Are you really happy with how Germany is being governed right now, are you? And this is presenting a really childish view of what a racial difference is. A racial difference is a difference in probability, it's a difference in average, right? So certain things are more common among white people than among non-white people, but that is not to say that there are no white people who don't conform to what is normal among white people. Also, I don't even know what point he's trying to make of this Germany thing. I mean, Germany has a relatively free economy by world standards, since that seems to be what he's talking about economics. People don't like how Germany is being governed, a lot of people on the right don't, because of their immigration policy. But there's nothing non-white, sadly, about having a liberal immigration policy. In fact, this is something that almost only white countries do. And so again, not a somehow counterexample to the, the idea that race matters. He says, race does not have ideals. It's just a melanin level. It's just a skin color or place of origin. If you think it does, you are absolutely indistinguishable. You are identical to the identity politics left, to the intersectional left. Now, this was a crazy comment, right? It verges on incoherence. Firstly, it's just skin color or a place of origin. Those aren't the same thing. It has to be one or the other. You know, see albino Africans. And saying we're, you know, the, the, and saying that far-right people are absolutely indistinguishable from the intersectional left, this is a very childish way of talking. Obviously, they're distinguishable. For instance, how do they feel about white people? What he's trying to say is they have something in common. But he can't say that. He can't talk like an adult for some reason. He has to do this thing where he uses extremely hyperbolic language, and it's very silly. Now look, the fact of the matter is that individuals differ because they differ in genes and environments. Everyone knows this, it's generally accepted, and the same is true of groups. 
you know, if we look at genes, right, and, and these days we know about certain genes, and if you have these versions of these genes, you're more likely to have a high IQ or you're more likely to be nonconformist, and those versions of those genes are more common in nations that score highly on measures of intelligence and individualism. You know, what a coincidence, and obviously this is not a coincidence, and this is the sort of evidence that leads to the fact that if you look at the surveys, a majority of experts in intelligence research actually do think that genes are involved in racial differences in, for instance, intelligence. And, you know, we can talk very briefly about this intelligence thing. Intelligence is not everything, but individuals who score highly on IQ tests, and IQ tests themselves only measure maybe a part of what we normally consider intelligence, but the part it measures right is such that people who score highly on IQ tests tend to have higher incomes, and they tend to have a more free market ideology, which I'm bringing up here because... Shapiro is a fan of that. And the fact is that if you look at a bunch of countries at a point in time, the ones that have higher IQs tend to be wealthier and more economically free. And if you look at countries over time, increases in IQ at the national level predict future increases in wealth and economic freedom. So Shapiro's insistence here that differences between groups can't affect how people think, this is just a kind of dogmatic denialism of the relevant science. It has nothing to do with what the evidence says at all. Speaking of not liking evidence, let's talk about some of the ridiculous stuff Shapiro said about anti-Semitism. He did this thing where he was listing off Facebook comments and tweets that I guess were by Nick Fuentes that he thinks substantiate the claim that he's anti-Semitic. And many of these things were just factual statements, again showing that he's kind of full of crap with his little saying, facts don't care about your feelings. He seems to think that facts about Jews care an awful lot about his feelings. He attacked Fuentes for saying, supposedly anyway, saying, quote, quote, so-called Jewish values tend to favor liberal and internationalist positions like abortion, foreign intervention, multiculturalism, homosexuality, and mass immigration. And Shapiro doesn't argue against this. And there's a reason why. Because this is just true. I mean, this is it's silly to say it's not. Jewish Americans have been majority voting for the Democrat Party for longer than anyone else. Longer than Asian Americans, longer than Hispanic Americans. Well, we don't have data on Hispanic Americans before the 70s, but longer than African Americans, right? Before the Great Depression. Jewish Americans were already solid Democrats. So they hold the record in that. And you might say, well, what does that matter? They're 2% of the population. Their votes don't really change society in any important way. And that's true. So let's talk about a list uh, created by The Forward. The Forward, a mainstream Jewish magazine. Shapiro has cited it. And they had a list of the top 50 political donors. And The Forward analyzed this in terms of who was Jewish and who wasn't. So going by their list, the fact is that the vast majority, almost 80% of mega donors to the Democrat Party are Jewish, whereas less than a third of mega donors to the Republican Party are Jewish. So again, these are just the facts. And here's one more fact. You know, in the 80s, there was a survey of 1,300 American elites, and it was done in a peer-reviewed journal by Jewish authors, and it looked at people who had a high status in the military, the media, the law, the government, etc. And what it showed was that the left-wing bias of American elites is explained by the presence of so many left-wing Jewish individuals in our elite class. The Gentile elite at that time actually leaned conservative, but the elites as a whole didn't. They leaned strongly liberal because of the inclusion of so many Jewish individuals, and Jews made up almost a third of the American elite at that time, even though making up only about 2% of the population. And again, these are just facts, which Shapiro, at least according to his rhetoric, should be fine with. And you know, today that might not be true, right? Today it might be that even Gentile elites lean left because Back in the day, once liberal people got a foothold in our institutions, what they did was they started discriminating against conservatives. I think Shapiro fans are well aware of this, that they discriminated against conservatives and only let liberal people in or disproportionately let liberal people in. And this increased the degree of liberal bias in our institutions. But they couldn't have done that if they didn't initially gain control. And the way they did that was via the influx of Jewish people into the country during the first half of the 20th century. Right? And then the kids of those people and the people that came in at the later side of that half of the 20th century becoming, for instance, academics or involved in the media, etc. And this just statistically having the effect of making it so that now the American elite leaned to the left. But enough about America, or at least stuff that is only having to do with America. Let's talk about Israel now, because the Groypers have been going, and they've been asking about the USS Liberty, this thing where, back in the day, Israel attacked a ship of ours called the USS Liberty. They say they thought it was an Egyptian vessel. This was during a conflict with Egypt. The U.S. government accepts this claim. Some people, including the survivors of the attack, say that the U.S. government is lying about this. People like Shapiro and Crenshaw say that they know that the government is not lying about this because they asked the government, they looked at the government's reports, and by golly, the government said they weren't lying. Obviously, this is very silly, but even if we're only looking at things that governments admit to, we have a lot to complain about concerning our good friends in Israel. So you look at the Levon affair, right? This plan in 1954 that Israel tried to carry out where their plan was to bomb 
assets by the U.S. in Egypt, blame it on Muslims so that the U.S. would pursue a more aggressive Middle East foreign policy. No one denies that, and the fact is that uh, you might say that's a long time ago, 1954, but in 2005, Israel held a ceremony honoring those who had participated in this event. You know, no one denies that adjusted for inflation, America has given over $230 billion in aid to Israel. And no one denies that groups like APAC and the Anti-Defamation League continue to play a significant role in American politics, even though they've both been investigated for spying on the U.S. on behalf of Israel. And, you know, speaking of spying, something else that no one denies, but not a lot of people remember, is that Paul Wolfowitz was investigated for spying on the U.S. government on behalf of Israel back in the 1970s. Recall that Paul Wolfowitz was the Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Bush administration's first term, and headed, or co-headed rather, this group, the Office of Special Plans. The Office of Special Plans was this special intelligence gathering and analyzing organization that the Bush, Bush administration created to get by the CIA. And today, many people say that this organization produced false or misleading intelligence to get us into the war of Iraq. And again, that organization was co-led by someone who previously was investigated for spying on us. It's a bit strange. Co-led. Who was the other guy who was leading this? It was a man named Douglas Feith. And he also has a strange, or at least interesting, connection to Israel. Back in the mid-90s, he was working for the Israeli government. He wrote a policy paper for them in which he was talking about how it was an important strategic objective for Israel to remove Saddam Hussein and talking about how they could turn global opinion against countries like Syria by saying that they were making, quote, weapons of mass destruction. And so those are strange things about the Office of Special Plans that it was run by two people, both of whom had connections to Israel, one who was investigated for spying on us on behalf of Israel, and, and the other who was working for Israel in the 90s, writing stuff about how great it would be if Saddam Hussein wasn't in power. Another thing no one questions at all is that people working under Wolfowitz and Fife, like Lawrence Franklin, were later convicted of spying on the U.S. for Israel. And so sure, the U.S. government says that the USS Liberty attack was not intentional. But there are lots of things that the USS government does not deny, which again, you look at these things and you think, well, are they really so great of an ally? these Israelis. And again, I say that as someone, and I don't think would be anti-Semitic to oppose the existence of Israel, but I don't oppose the existence of Israel. I just oppose them fucking with our country. Now, the last issue to deal with here has to do with what America is, right? So Ben Shapiro says that America is a propositional nation, that it's only about ideas and has nothing, and it's nothing to do with race. And he substantiates this by saying that he says, you know, I don't know if, if you've heard this, but in fact, in the Declaration of Independence, it says that all men are created equal and that they're all endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Now, again, this is just like really stupid. So imagine that you think that everyone is equal in the sense that they are endowed by their creator with certain rights. Does that mean that everyone thinks the same? That everyone creates the same kind of civilization? That everyone should be together in a single country? It doesn't mean any of those things. And we know that the founders did not think that. So you have Thomas Jefferson, the same guy who wrote All Men Are Created Equal. He said, quote, when freed, the Negro is to be removed beyond the reach of mixture. And by mixture, he meant basically interracial mating. James Madison had the same view. He said the freed blacks ought to be permanently removed beyond the region occupied or allotted to a white population. You look at the Federalist Papers. What is the second one written by John Jay say? It says that it says that Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to a one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors. That's the first thing he lists. He says a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs, and it goes on. And so you can see here the idea is that the essence of America isn't just ancestry, but it includes ancestry. Even Abe Lincoln said there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together in terms of social and political equality. Harry Truman said, I am strongly of the belief that Negroes ought to be in Africa, yellow men in Asia, and white men in Europe and America. And this viewpoint was not just substantiated by presidents in quotes, it was also manifest in our laws, right? The Naturalization Act of 1790, of course, said that if you were coming here and you wanted to be naturalized as a citizen, you had to be a free white person of good character. So we let people come here who were non-white, but they weren't naturalized as citizens, and this was before birthright citizenship, and when too many people came, we just put an end to it, right? Like, for instance, in 1875, we said there are too many Chinese people here. We passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, and that said that from now on, we're just not taking Chinese immigrants. We did a slightly lesser version, but basically the same thing with the Johnson Reed Act of 1924 to Southern and Eastern Europeans. And of course, you kind of have to just stop immigration because it would be uh, rather costly to deport a bunch of people back to somewhere like China, right? 
or to Europe because there's a sea in between. But that's not true for everywhere, right? So Mexico is obviously connected to us by land, and what did we used to do? Well, in 1954, the Eisenhower administration deported more than a million Mexicans back to Mexico in one single big operation. And so you look at this and you start to see that people like Ben Shapiro and the rest of the mainstream conservative movement do not believe in free speech, the open exchange of ideas, uh, the placement of facts over feelings, traditional moral norms, or even the traditional idea of what America is. But of course, there are some people who do believe in these things. There are people who naturally want America to have sober and rational debate about things. And there are people who are inclined to oppose sexual degeneracy or to dislike anti-white bigotry. There are people who naturally care about their people's history, about being part of a civilizational project which is greater than themselves. And, and, and there are people who are predisposed in these ways and they look around for a movement that corresponds to their inclinations. And they see the mainstream conservative movement and it has the rhetoric and the symbolism which matches these values and so those people get misdirected into that kind of a movement when in fact again conservatives shut down rational discussion they follow the left's lead on sexual norms they oppose any attempt by white people to organize and actually oppose anti-white racism in an effective way and they distort beyond recognition the history and meaning of the united states of america and so the function and i'm not going to speak about the conscious intention of the people involved in the conservative movement because who the hell knows but the function of these people is to sabotage the right-wing impulses in people and the rationalist impulses for that matter in people to funnel these energies into a movement that achieves almost nothing other than war and corporate tax cuts according to this sort of thinking the only political values really worth fighting for are zionism and consumerism and in so doing they prevent the rise of any political movement which might actually serve as a manifestation of identity tradition or even rationality and so if you actually value any of those things, one of them, two of them, all of them, if you value any of those things in a serious way and want to see them manifest in our society in a political movement, then you should be opposed to these people who are sabotaging the natural process by which that might occur. And that's really been the virtue of this Groiper War thing so far, that these people going to these events have asked questions that have really shown the face of the conservative movement for what it is in a more explicit and obvious and concentrated way than would normally occur.